Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Taking Control of Your Diabetes Facebook Live in a series of COVID issues and people with diabetes. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Chris Halpern, who is an attorney, but also has been specializing in the rights of people with diabetes his whole career, actually. And I'm gonna let him tell you a little bit about himself, uh, how he got into the field and what kind of areas he covers. But first, the big disclaimer, just like I tell you all the time, I'm not your doctor. Please don't change your medications based on anything I say. And Chris is not your lawyer. So it's important that if you have a particular issue that you get your own legal help up for sure, we're gonna offer general expressions and considerations of issues and concerns that may impact you and your concerns about handling your diabetes in different situations. So we have a lot of really interesting information to cover. Uh, this COVID uh, situation in the workplace is pretty complicated. But first, uh, let our viewers uh, uh, know a little bit about yourself. And I just should say one thing that Chris has been a speaker at many of our TCOID conferences, including the very first one for at least 10, 15 years. And then the legal issues fell off. We were talking a lot about managed care, but Chris has continued to uh, focus his work on people with diabetes. Chris, thanks for coming on today. Hey, Steve, thank you. And, and uh, great to be with you again on this um, over the web now <laughs> as we do it. Um, Chris, are you muted by chance? Oh, boy. there you go. We can hear you. You hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Did you not hear me saying hello? I'm sorry. No, we didn't. Start over. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you again, Steve. Thank you for, for uh, inviting me to be on with you today. Yeah. Tell us, uh, tell us about how you got into diabetes. Well, you know, I was diagnosed myself when I was uh, uh, in college and luckily got involved in, by, uh, by the doctor who diagnosed me um asked me to join what was then a, a unique study into the treatment of diabetes called the diabetes control and complications trial which steve you you know all about because it ended up being the most uh, important trial ever conducted in in the treatment of people with type 1 diabetes and proved that that tight management actually works and saves us from the risk of of complications throughout our body so, so that was how I began. And then when, when it became clear that the, what was then considered the experimental type management treatment worked, I was asked by DCCT to give a speech. And Steve, you were in attendance at that speech and that was just when you were thinking about starting TCOID. And then you saw that you were there in San Diego and uh, asked me to join with TCOID. Yeah, that was only 25 years ago, Chris. Uh, you, <laughs> so you my know, memory may not be perfect. <laughs> yeah, I should. The, the DCCT is called the Diabetes Complication and Control Trial. And Chris is right, it's the single most important study in type 1 diabetes because it finally proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that if physicians and people with diabetes go through the hassle trying to get their A1C down, they will avoid complications. And even if they had complications, it will prevent the progression. Now, Chris, I don't know if you can do this quickly. Uh, but um, could you tell the story about when you went to college, you had to eat everything in your kitchen? And I think that's worth starting off because that's the story I remember about you. We have a lot to talk about. So try to do that in that, one minute. That, that story will actually resonate more with, with, with uh, uh, Talia at this moment because viewers may not know that Steve, your daughter, has just graduated from law school and she's waiting to take the bar exam. But because of COVID, that wait is... It's seem, seemingly endless for her right now. Well, after I took the bar, um, I decided that I was going to go see Europe for the first time ever, and I didn't have much money. And so I, I bought my ticket and just decided I was going to go as long as I could and until my money ran out and I had to come back to the United States and get to work. And I was slowly eating everything in my refrigerator because I knew it was I was going to be gone for as long as I could and I didn't want the food to go bad so I just ate everything in my <laughs> refrigerator little by little until I was the day I was ready to fly to Europe and take off and there was going to be nothing left in my fridge that was going to spoil while I was gone and 
sure enough, I had a low blood sugar that night after I'd eaten everything I had. And I, I, you know, those were the days when glucose tabs weren't around and, and I, I, you know, I needed to treat it with food that I didn't seem to have much of. So I, I was low and struggling to find something. And the only thing I hadn't already eaten that was in a closet was a package of prunes. And so I just scarfed down a box of prunes to recover from that low. But of course I had to fly to Europe that morning. <laughs> having just eaten an entire box of prunes well i think just I think, the the trip the flight was probably more difficult for the guy in the aisle seat than it was for me <laughs> that is a great story i'll never forget that um chris um before we get into some specific questions tell us what kind of legal issues you've been dealing with over the years to give people an idea and i've been involved in some of those uh cases you know as an expert but uh, yeah, what kind of areas have you been involved with? Well, in the beginning of TCOID, before I was really doing this most of my time as a lawyer, um, I, we were all concerned, all of us with, with type 1 were concerned about how we were going to get health insurance, if we could get it, whether we could keep it, if we lost a job, had a divorce, and, we, and our insurance was through our spouse. I, all those issues were terrifying. Um, and, and in the beginning, that's what I was focused on. What do we do? How do we get insured? And if we get insurance, how do we make sure they pay for the things we need? In those days, it, insulin pumps were new and it was hard to get them approved. Um, so that was a long time ago and, and now we're in a different world. But, but those concerns continue now in different ways. And, and in fact, I think um, maybe, maybe Brittany can post uh, a link uh, to the American Diabetes Association, which is looking into and trying to generate help for people to pay for insulin. That's now an, an issue. Anyway, that's one issue that I dealt with in the beginning 25 years ago and for probably the first 10 years a lot. Now I, I began focusing more on, on driving issues for people with diabetes. If people lose their driving license or they get examined and they're afraid of what to say or how to say it. Um, I get a lot of clients with in people for people 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 in that situation. Um, I've done a lot over the years with people who now who 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 are in jail or taken into custody and how they're going to be treated uh, in those situations if they have diabetes and they need access to insulin. I'm working on a case right now in that regard. Um, I also work with people in employment situations, and, and that's really, I think, what we're going to talk about mostly today, um, but I've been doing that for a number of years. People who, who have diabetes and need some kind of reasonable accommodations at work and try to get an employer to understand their needs, how to do that, and if they don't get their needs accommodated, what do they then do? And hopefully you can, you can always avoid a lawsuit, but if you can't, that's now a big part of what I do. You know, Chris, um, I just got a text a few days ago from a friend that was a headlines that um, a type one diabetic for the first time flew a Southwest Airlines flight as a commercial pilot. So we've come a long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, um, what, in terms of, let's start opening up the questions. Um, how, as a kind of a general opening, you know, how has COVID impacted employment concerns for people with diabetes? Well, people with diabetes, like everybody else, have concerns and fears about work, whether we can return to work, how we can be safe when we return to work. To that extent, we're, we're no different than anybody else. The one difference that is, you know, from all the work you're doing on these podcasts and and hearing from all the thousands of people with diabetes you hear from all the time we as people with diabetes are constantly hearing that people with diabetes are more at risk and so it's drummed into our heads all the time to maybe be even more fearful than the rest of the population and more anxious about returning to work and going out of our homes and going on with our lives so, so these concerns are 
serious in, in, in particular for all of us. Um, and that's really something that, that I am grateful that TCOID is doing all this work to try to address those issues, address our fears. Some are real, some are fears that are no different than other people have, but some are truly um, significant concerns that, that we do have and need assistance in resolving and need to understand how we can resolve them. Yeah, Chris, you know, um, you know, the first, the, the next question really is a general one, but we should probably talk about the hottest topic right now in the news, which is returning to school and teachers. Uh, but in general, what should people be thinking about in terms of returning to work? And I, you know, and that, of course we all have different types of jobs. Uh, we have different types of interaction with people and, you know, social distancing issues. But I just want to say something about fear. One thing I've noticed talking to patients, colleagues, friends, people that work at TCOID, everybody has their own level of fear. You know, on one end of the spectrum, people think they won't get it. And unfortunately, they may not do have much pay much attention to social distancing. And then the other end of the spectrum is people locked in their house, scared to death to go out. And I think most of us are somewhere in between. But I think we have to respect the fact that uh, everyone has their own level of fear. And it comes from a lot of different things, how you were raised, your own, your own personality, things like that. So um, in general, you know, I, I saw something that you wrote that interests me. You said that because you're afraid of COVID, it doesn't mean that you don't have to go to work. Did I, did I see that correctly? Uh, you, you did. And, and thank you for bringing that up because I think that's an initial issue that we do have to discuss if our audience is mostly people with diabetes who are wondering about their work rights. The, issue, the, the way to begin to think about it is you have to be able and qualified to do the work, which of course is a, a, a perfect example is the Southwest Airlines pilot that you just mentioned. And that fight went on for years, whether somebody who was on insulin, who has diabetes and needs to manage it with insulin, is capable of doing the work. And geez, I remember years ago, Steve, you, you had on a, a, a man with type one diabetes who flew around the world with yeah. insulin. He, I, I've forgotten his name, he was, he was brilliant. And, and um, on his own private plane, Douglas Cairns. Douglas yeah. Cairns, my God, he, he was fascinating to watch, to hear him discuss how he managed to fly alone on his on his own small plane around the world with type 1 diabetes proving me, that it can be done let me add without a continuous glucose monitor so he, he you know so he had to prick his finger he didn't know what direction his blood sugar was going well so chris what what about people with diabetes returning to work what what do they need to ask themselves and their situation uh, and and I would say, let's talk about their conversation with their employers too. Well, the first issue is, is you already earlier suggested, you have to be able to do the job. So you can't simply say, okay, I'm afraid because of COVID and I'm not gonna come back to work because you know I'm diabetic and therefore I'm at risk and, and I can't do the, and I'm not gonna do it and you can't make me. If you take that position, it seems to me that the, employer's argument is, well, you've just told me you can't do the work, so you're not qualified for the position. Mm -hmm. So you can't just automatically tell the employer, no, I, you have to do what I say because I have diabetes. You, you just can't handle it that way. What you have to do is begin a process of asking for reasonable accommodations if, in fact, that's what's necessary. Everybody has fears that are legitimate right now. We all do. And that's what's happened in, in, in the teacher's situation. Any teacher right now is anxious about how this is going to work when schools resume. A teacher who happens to have diabetes may or may not have an additional fear. If, in fact, they do have a legitimate additional fear, related to their diabetes, because diabetes is a recognized disability, they then have an obligation to discuss that with their employer, to say, hey, 
I have diabetes, I want to keep doing my job, but these are my fears. And you got to be able to explain as calmly and as carefully and simply as you can what it is that your fears are based upon and what it is that the employer can do to accommodate those fears. It's all got to begin with a conversation, just like we're having here. Now, I'm, I'm speaking maybe more than, than, than you at this moment, Steve, but that's because I'm kind of taking the position of the person coming to my employer. I'm almost pretending in a way that you're my employer. And now I got to justify myself and my concerns to you as my employer. That's, so, so in the beginning, maybe I'll speak more, but then you're going to have thoughts and I have to then be quiet and listen to your thoughts. Yeah, you know what? Um, I, I really like the way you articulated that because, um, you know, you just have to think about what you're going to say and what is, I think the, the legal phrase is reasonable accommodations about legitimate fears. And that's what you wrote to me earlier. Um, and having a conversation, I think that's that part is so important. It's, it's like anything in life, communication. So you how do we get, um, can we get support from our, uh, our caregivers, our, our doctors? How does that work? And does that help the situation? The first thing to be concerned about is whether or not you actually have a concern based on your disability, which is unique because of your disability, related to your disability, and how to explain that. Now, Steve, we've had conversations about whether or not anybody who happens to have diabetes has a particular greater risk and what that means when that happens, when it doesn't happen. And TCOID has been addressing that for since COVID began, really. Yeah. Um, and I've watched a lot of these talks for, about that issue on Facebook. Um, and so now we're, we're having that again. So, so the place to begin, especially if you're unsure as a patient, as a person with diabetes, if you can address that issue with your own physician, that is really the way to begin. What, if any, additional concerns do I have because of my diabetes condition? Or should I take extra precautions because of my diabetes? I, am I at a greater risk? Can you walk me through that? That's, that's I think, the place to begin if, assuming you can get access to your physician right now. That's not always so easy. I hope it's getting easier. Yeah, I, I actually think it's easier these days because uh, most physicians and caregivers, nurse practitioners, I should say, PAs, uh, they're used to doing video visits. Uh, and so I find that, you know, at least if you're in a system with electronic medical records like, like UCSD, you send a message and if the doctor doesn't see it, the nurse reminds the doctor that they got a note. And I think that's important. I should say, like, you know, like you said, Chris, we've had several Facebook Lives. My, my, my issue is this, if you have type one diabetes and your A1C, your glucose control is good, you don't have any other underlying conditions like heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, your risk of getting it uh, and surviving is probably the same as anybody else based on your age. Now you and I, we're in our, <clears throat> I don't wanna say it, but um, if you're in your twenties, that's one thing. Our only risk factor, I mean, your only risk factor is your age. I have. I have some kidney issues, so that puts me at more at risk. But if you have type two, uh, by nature, most folks with type two do have underlying conditions, you know, because they have a tendency to be heavy. And I think being heavy is for sure a risk factor for surviving COVID. And many people with type two have heart disease and kidney disease and things like that. So I think everybody uh, with diabetes, type one or type two, just needs to be ultra careful. And you mentioned to me uh, off the offline is that uh, the CDC guidelines are something to, to know well, and we will post that link as well. Um, so I think that's really important. So um, I don't know, I might call on Talia, who's uh, a phantom guest. You're gonna hear her voice if there have been any questions that you guys have posted. I'll let you go ahead, Talia. Sure. Um, one question that came in um, asks, 
what if I have to quarantine due to an exposure? Does my work have to pay me for that time? Yeah, that's funny. That That is one of the questions that, that I emailed Steve about before this began, because I cut and paste something that's going around in, in the teacher community. Um, what, what, what happens if I'm a teacher and I'm ordered to return to school and, and one of the children in the class comes down with COVID? Okay, now what happens? Uh, are, am I supposed to go home and, and be quarantined for 14 days? Are all the children? And what about the parents of those children? Are, are they now having to be quarantined? I, I mean, you can take that one instance and extrapolate it to an extraordinary amount of people. So to answer the question, I would say for, you, you got to focus on a couple of things. First, your particular situation, what's going on, how at risk you were, were you, in the question, was the person, I, I can't remember, uh, uh, Talia, was the person diagnosed? Um, it doesn't say, it just says if they have to quarantine for two weeks, will they be paid for that time away? Okay, so, so the first issue is uh, if they have to quarantine, what does that mean? Why do they have to quarantine? How clear is it that the person actually does need to quarantine? Are they told by the employer, you can't come in for 14 days for X reasons, and it's the employer who tells them this and makes that decision? Or are they telling the employer, hey, I'm worried because I went somewhere and now this is a concern? There's, it's got to begin with that conversation between the employer and the employee. Now, assuming there's an understanding that really you do have to quarantine, now the issue is, okay, am I going to get paid for my time off during the quarantine, which really is, is the question that was being asked. And that answer will depend on your particular employer as well as your jurisdiction. Now, there are federal laws that may help you, but this is where I generally feel like you got to talk to a specific lawyer about your specific situation so we can make sure how it applies. And in fact, we have some a site, a link to geographical des locations that are posted on the CDC website that address exactly those issues for, for different locations all over the country. And as Steve mentioned earlier, this that CDC website is really a wonderful place to begin because it does go through these item by item and it will walk you through different professions, different businesses, different jobs and explain what kind of precautions will work, how it's used and, and, and um, how, what, what kind of reasonable accommodations you might request. Chris, um... You know, there's, you know, what always boggles my mind is how these rules can change from state to state, but that's a whole different issue. But um, is the approach different if, let's say, for myself, I'm a healthcare provider, I got diabetes, um, other first responders, uh, compared to non-essential workers, let's say you work in an office, uh, does it, do those, does your profession actually make a difference or should, should everyone be treated same in terms of a reasonable accommodations. Well, the profession will make a difference. It has to make a difference because depending on what your need is, you may or may not be able to practice in that profession. And that's where it begins. That's where the conversation begins. Can you do the job? So one of my first cases uh, that, that I handled representing somebody with type one in an employment situation was somebody who was trying to get a job as a firefighter. And he was refused. And it wasn't because of his type 1 diabetes. It was because he had some degree of retinopathy. And then it became an issue. Well, can you see? Are you qualified to be a firefighter because of your vision concerns? And we had to then go to his uh, doctor, his, his optometrist and his ophthalmologist, and have them fill out forms explaining why they felt he could do the work. So they looked at his job duties and said, yeah, he can do these things. 
here's his medical situation, but he can do those all those duties. So that's why the, it differs for the occupation because you do have to focus on what the duties are. Here's another example. What if somebody is a type two and does have very serious risks that their complication might be exacerbated mm -hmm. by COVID. And so they're now at a serious fear that is legitimate and different from just anybody. In that situation, now you have to look at the job. Well, can the job be done at home so that they aren't exposed to other people who may put them more at risk? That's a critical issue. We're all now learning more and more to work at home. But some jobs, you can't do it. And if you literally cannot possibly work only at home or primarily at home, you have to, you can't request an accommodation that allows you to stay at home and work over your computer because that's not what the job requires. But if you can find an accommodation request that allows you to do the work, then you can work and, and say to your employer, look, I want to do the job. I'm more at risk for these reasons, but I want to come in and do the job. So what I need is to be allowed to clean my hands, to be allowed to wear a face mask with a cover, to make sure that the people I interact with also either keep a social distance, wear a mask, wear a cover. You know, you can go through those requests item by item, determining how to make yourself safe. And once again, those CDC guidelines are really wonderful because what they do is they walk you through each type of occupation um, general in general terms, but they've got a broad list um, and they walk you through what are the ways to make your worker or your employees in the, the CDC guidelines are speaking to the employer in the section I'm talking about, but they walk the employer through how to make employees safe. Mm -hmm. And those are really things that can be requested as accommodations. And for somebody who's more at risk, maybe we have a little bit easier time to argue that these really are reasonable accommodations for a person with a disability who has a greater risk to disease if these accommodations aren't provided. And if you can show that the CDC is recommending it, I think in a lot of situations, it's tough for an employer to say, well, no, we're, we're not going to do it. Uh, you've got a federal agency whose job it is to determine how to work safely and to make these recommendations. And you're just asking for something that is straightforward, relatively simple, clearly supported by the factual evidence that currently exists. That's where I'd begin with that analysis. Yeah, you know, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have some more questions and I have a couple more, but I'll wait for for mine for towards the end. Talia, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, someone asked you to repeat some of the questions you might ask a doctor about fears related to diabetes or other issues. Um, for example, if someone has had a kidney transplant, if this puts them at greater risk. And I think the question is asking um, how to talk to your doctor about these fears and then how you might translate that to an employer? I actually think Steve is, is, is I, I'm more curious to hear what Steve's going to say in response than, than myself. Well, I can say a few things and then you could jump in there and how you would present that to your employer. Um, you know, okay, I can repeat that again. And we have a, a, a Facebook live that I did with Dr. Jeremy Pettis, but you know, if you, if you look at quote unquote underlying conditions, uh, you take someone with type one, and I, I don't know much about your health issues, Chris, we got HIPAA rules here, but I'm assuming that you're healthy, your control's decent, uh, you don't have kidney disease, you don't have heart disease, you got stiff joints from being so old like me, but um, you don't really have any underlying medical conditions, any asthma, lung conditions, that your risk for getting COVID and surviving it is the same as other people your age without type one. Now, type two, Type two, inherently, those folks do have a lot of medical problems. 
uh, especially what we call central obesity, which is just kind of being heavy. That's part of the genetic condition, but also because type twos get it when they're older, they may have more heart disease, more kidney disease. And, uh, you know, the older you get, you get other medical conditions that may or may not be related to diabetes, but anybody with a transplant is going to be on immunosuppressants and anybody on immunosuppressants put them at a much greater risk for getting any type of infection, COVID, the flu, <clears throat> bacterial infection, urinary tract infection. So um, I, I think what I would do is um, I would have a conversation with your doctor and say, you know, if you're fearful, say, are there any medical conditions that put me more at risk for getting COVID and surviving if I do get it? For example, will it increase my chances for being in the hospital, the length of hospital stay, the chance of being innovated, and quite frankly, the, the chance of passing away. So no one really knows for sure. It's like asking a doctor, how long are you gonna live with a certain cancer? We, can't, we don't know, uh, but we can just tell you in generality is what we do know from what, how you mentioned it, Chris, so nicely, the, the existing literature. And we're learning more about COVID every day. Uh, the thing that scares me sometimes personally is that I, I see pe perfectly young, healthy people in their 30s getting si very sick and passing away from COVID with no diabetes and no underlying condition. So there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and I think, Chris, uh, you know, the best way to uh, talk to your employer about that, and let me add on, let me add on two little things. If you can remember more than one question at a time, that's tough for me. Um, what, what if you, let's say you get a letter from your doctor, a note, and what if your employer uh, just refuses to give you reasonable accommodations and you're fearful of going back to work? Uh, what, what are your options at that point? Yeah, I actually just had a call uh, over the weekend with somebody in, in precisely that situation where the employer refused to take the treating physician's comments seriously. Uh, in, in that situation, it was somebody who wants to go back to work following an injury. And the physician wrote, the treating physician wrote that this person is perfectly fine, able to return to work as a firefighter. This wasn't a diabetes situation. It was another illness that she had had. Um, and the employer said, well, we're, we, you have to go see an occupational therapist and get back to us. We're, we're, we don't care about your treating physician. Well, th that position is, is just in my opinion, just black, black and white wrong. Um, and if they want to want to use an occupational therapist that they want to hire, okay, they, they can go ask her to, to be considered by occupational therapist. And then the employee would have to employee. We're not going to look at the note or care when we don't care about your treating physicians position about your ability to return to work. That, that's asking for a lawsuit which is you know, where this is heading if they continue that. So, so the next step, if you're having a dispute of this nature, is to make a complaint. If necessary, you first have to have the conversation. You first have to have that discussion where you try to have a meaningful interaction. Um, but if the employer just ref either refuses to have a meaningful interaction or takes positions that, that are legally wrong as far as you can tell and of course you know you do need to talk to a lawyer perhaps at that stage um to find out if their position is wrong and make sure that that what seems to be wrong really is legally wrong um at that point you look at making a complaint um if it's a federal if you want to file your complaint on, in a federal juris, uh, 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 agency, you look to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and they take complaints all over the country. Um, and, or you can look to your own state. Most, not all, but most states will have a state agency um, that will also take these kinds of discrimination, disability discrimination complaints. So you can make a complaint to one or the other agency you could maybe even do it to both. Um, I wouldn't want to contradict myself, but you know, I'd want to be careful if I did it to more than one. Yeah. And most agencies um, will will cooperate with one another, so that you don't have to choose. Um, you don't usually have to choose to do but file a complaint both 
with a state agency and a federal agency for, for either or both agencies to consider all the laws, be it state or federal. Usually, if you file with one, it'll be accepted for both. But that's something you got to look at in your particular state and see if that's true. Uh, this, this but anyway, me. that's the next step in the process is to turn to one of these agencies, file a complaint, at which point you have to be able to say, this is my disability. This is why I need a reasonable accommodation. I did make a request. This is who I made it to. This is how I made it. These were the accommodation requests that I made. If you could attach a letter, a document from a physician, that will certainly help to demonstrate that you actually made that effort and, and tried very hard to have a conversation with your employer. And if you have emails, texts, whatever you may have that prove the efforts you made and the response from the employer, if you believe the response was inadequate, unfair, insufficient, it's good to have that. So you can then show that to the agency and say, look, I tried. I made that interactive request and they just rejected me. At that point, you make that complaint. The agency, hopefully, will try to resolve it between you and the employer, maybe work out an agreement that they take you back, that they provide accommodations, that they say to, you, to the employer, look, this seems reasonable. What's your response? Why, why can't you do this? They even will have an interactive process uh, with the agency. Normally, you start out by having an interactive process between employer and employee, but the agency will also have an interactive process where they try to repeat these, these efforts to resolve the situation. They have what's called a conciliation meeting where they try to resolve everything with you and the employer. If that doesn't work or if you don't want to go that long to try to resolve it, you can ask for a right to sue letter with most agencies. Again, not always, it'll depend on the jurisdiction. It will depend on your case. Um, but theoretically, you can go to a lawyer at that stage once you've made the, the complaint and it hasn't gotten resolved. At some point, if it doesn't get resolved, you may, get, you may request or be given a right to sue letter that allows you to go to court. And that there's, there's all kinds of deadlines on these issues, so you have to be careful about that. But that's the general way it works. Yeah, it, it seems to be complicated for us non-legal people, but um, this, is, this may be a dumb question, but is the Better Business Bureau, is that appropriate or does that relate to other things? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out as a state, where would someone find out information where to do these complaints? Like in California, for example. Well, you, you, there's a there's a state department of employment um, that you can make that complaint to in California, um, and maybe I can find a website that will list it that we can post later. Okay. Um, that's that's great. You know, most states will have some some form of labor commission, employment department, something, yeah. uh, discrimination uh, agency. They'll have something if if you Google around with those words, um, usually with your state, uh, it'll come up. Um, but you can, there's also, you can always make a complaint like that to the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I appreciate that. We'll post it, but I'd say um, I got an interesting question and I know you and I have some uh, experience with this question, but this person has an uncle who has type two diabetes who's incarcerated and they wanted to uh, know what can they do to help maybe get their uncle released because of the risk of getting COVID while they're incarcerated. And I don't know, I don't know what crime they committed. It probably doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think it matters. To me, it might matter, but uh, what, so what are, what are some of the comments there without getting it being that person's uncle's lawyer? There are a lot of people being released because of uh, medical risks related to diabetes or other reasons. I mean, in general, people who are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes are being released more than normal because of COVID. That, that's happening all over the country. 
people with diabetes, for the reasons you, Steve, earlier discussed, may be more at risk um, than other people. So there may be more of an argument for many of them why serious consideration for a, a, a release should be allowed and provided. And I would say that to begin that process, I would find if the person um, you're concerned about uh, has a physician who's willing to assist, willing to explain why this person is more at risk, what their issues are. Um, so the way, Steve, that you explained earlier, what kind of physical issues you'd look to, I'd make a list of those things. And I, and I, would, I would talk, if needed, be, with, with the person who's incarcerated to find out what their physical risks are and make sure I, I knew and understood them um, and make a list of them. See if you can get um, some support for why this person should get released to put themselves less at risk. That that's the process I'd begin, and of course you you gotta if you if you if you, there is a lawyer available, whether it's a public defender or a private attorney, somebody who's who's going to assist in in getting those those concerns addressed, um, or if the person has been incarcerated for some period of time, um, doesn't no long does no longer have a lawyer, has to do it themselves. If there's some place at the prison where they can turn to, to make these requests. Um, that, that is kind of an individual situation that you got to know a little bit more detail about the individual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've had some experience as you have, but on the doctor end and uh, sometimes uh, our incarcerated systems aren't, <laughs> aren't the best and most responsive. Okay. I just got a text from Talia. She's got another question. Sure. Um, we have some questions about concerns at an office um, where there might be, you know, a lot of people coming in and out and the person is, um, has raised these concerns, but their employer is citing a lack of funding. Um, and I guess generally the question would be when someone's at a workplace and they don't think that their employer is taking the proper precautions, um, what can they do or where can they report this? This is a great question and and really hard. I mean, I actually have a close friend who, who Steve, you also know, um, who is a nurse with type 1 diabetes and has been asking me questions about this since COVID began because her particular hospital doesn't seem to be handling it well and hasn't been giving uh, appropriate PPE um, throughout. And, and to that extent, she's in a situation that's the same for other nurses. Now she's particularly fearful because of her diabetes. So, so that's maybe separate, maybe not. Again, depending on her physical conditions and if she has uh, particular issues that are different than the other nurses in her hospital. But addressing this question, what if the employer is just not following reasonable guidelines? That may or may not be an issue that's dis disability discrimination. And if you're just like any other employee and you're all be tr being treated this way, but you still want to keep your job, you're no different than anybody else, perhaps. Again, it depends on your physical issues. Um, but in general, let's assume you're just no different than anybody else and the employer isn't doing reasonable things. What can you do? And I, I would begin by at least trying to have that interactive process. Frankly, I'd go to that CDC website and show the employer, look, the, these are things that the CDC has recommended for our business, for our area of work to be safer and show it to them. It may not be the case that they simply don't want to do it. It may be that they just don't know 
of these issues. So at least begin the conversation in a calm, respectful way as best you can. Then lose your temper and well, show them the middle finger. Chris, um, let me just interject uh, that I'm, I'm just making the assumption that people should document everything they've done with the employer. Uh, but I, I agree doing it in a calm way, but I, I have a feeling there's employers out there and it sounds like from the gist of that question, the employer didn't really, doesn't really care that much, but I'd imagine you wanna document every interaction, who you spoke with and what kind of documents you showed them and then consider going to some of the websites that we're gonna post where you can actually do a formal complaint. Well, Steve, I, I'd say that you could have gone to law school with Talia and been great at this job if you wanted, because <laughs> you're absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, there's going to be an issue of proving your efforts. And in documenting those efforts is critical. In this situation, if you can do it calmly and even put in writing, hey, have you seen these, these, uh, this advice from the from the, the the Center for Disease Control, this federal CDC, could you do this? Could we try harder to do these? And maybe even look and say, well, maybe this one costs money, maybe this one doesn't. It's certainly going to cost them more if they lose customers because they're they're doing things that are putting people at risk. And if they're going to lose employees because they're putting people at risk, that's not a good smart business move. And in the CDC website really is set up to speak to employers more than employees about how to do this safely and, and responsibly. And it also puts you in a really good position to say, I showed them this information. I gave it to them and they still didn't do it. You don't want to be in that position. You want to avoid that if you possibly can. But if you're going to have to go there eventually, you may as well have it really clear in writing that, that you did the best you could to, to give them that information. Yeah, I always remember you talking at TCOID about managed care and getting the services you need. You went through all the steps, make the phone call, write down who you spoke to, all the stuff. And the last ditch effort was to sue. But you always gave advice. You don't want to be in the position to sue. You got to pay a big lawyer bills and everything gets delayed. Uh, Chris, I got one last question and um, I'm not sure you know what you can say about it is, but I'm, someone texted me a question. They said that their employer has made reasonable uh, safety accommodations for everybody at work. And this person for didn't talk about the reasons, still scared to death of COVID and to go in but her employer has done everything that they could is her option is just to quit and to stay at home, which, which is what she feels comfortable doing. It may, it may be, I, I mean, based on just that information, I, I would say yes, <laughs> if that was all that the information there is, but I don't know. She may be not seeing something that's going on. I have, I'm not, I can't make guesses about it, but, but certainly people come to me with legal concerns and fears, and they don't really even know that they have a legal issue that exists. That's a good, I, that's a good point. So, so it, this might be a situation where you reach out for a local lawyer who knows the laws in your jurisdiction, who's willing to talk to you um, and see what they have to say. That, that's a possibility. Um, but, it, but if, in fact, you're just terrified of leaving your home because of COVID, I mean, if that's all I know about you, maybe you shouldn't be working right now. I, I don't know what to say. Clinical, maybe, get a, get, go to a clinical psychologist. Yeah, but, I, um, I mean, really, it, it may be, a, look, many millions of people, millions of us are very afraid with good reason. Yeah. Um, so, so it may be that you got to talk to somebody, a doctor, a friend, uh, a, a, a religious practitioner, who knows, somebody that you're close with, who you're comfortable with, who you respect, who can talk to you and figure out whether or not really maybe you can get past this and you can go to work safely. I love the fact that 
that your employer, speaking to this, this person, was willing to provide reasonable accommodations. To me, I, I would be so grateful to that employer. I, I would, if I'm going to go back to work, I want to work with an employer like that. I want yeah. them to, to make a living and, and I would feel safer and more comfortable working with somebody like that than somebody who just doesn't want to deal with it. And I mean, I don't know if anybody is in doing yeah. that nowadays, but you know, it certainly right. it was hopeful to hear that. Well, Chris, I think that uh, you mentioned one thing that um, is important. That person may not realize if they have any medical conditions or any reason why it puts them at added risk. So I think if they're not sure, they should talk to their caregiver um, uh, about that. There were a few more questions about type one diabetes and risk. And I just want to refer people to the Facebook Live I did with Jeremy Pettis that's on the TCOID website to repeat a lot of the stuff and in, and in greater detail. So with that, Chris, uh, gosh, we've used up almost an hour. How much do I owe you? Did you have me on the clock? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? For all you folks out there, when Chris spoke, I always used to get up on the podium and make fun of lawyers. And the, one day after like 10 years, Chris said to me, Steve, I've had it. Can you, he politely asked me to stop all the lawyer jokes. So now uh, my daughter's in law school, my girlfriend went to law school, I'm surrounded by lawyers. So it came back to bite me. It came end. back to haunt you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Chris, uh, do you have any closing comments and then we'll let people get on with their day? I, other than, than just, um, you know, it's always easier to say than to do, especially when somebody is maybe being thoughtless or rude or mean, it's always easier to say, hey, be calm and try to talk it out. And I've been in situations I could tell you about where I felt like, you know, that's unfair because I've tried and the other side isn't. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's best if you can possibly avoid these fights, especially litigation, because it gets painful, difficult, expensive it's not fun if you can possibly avoid it i would say it's almost always better but if you, you know can't, what? at least we do have laws where people aren't supposed to treat you like crap yeah you know what um such great advice and uh you're really uh, uh such a professional uh, lawyer and i i do have the most respect for you because you do you do a lot of things with passion and i think that's that makes you a really good lawyer so um okay well i'm gonna let tabitha end it uh and i would say at this point you can turn off your your zoom chris and thanks again